Hey, Clarence, how's it going? Hey, Andy, yeah, I'm a little stressed, man. The light board is having some glitches and I had one of my musicians cancel this morning and I'm trying to get these arrangements done by this weekend. Oh, that reminds me. I need you to write a song for my message this weekend and it needs to be good. Remember, God never gives us more than we can handle. <laughs> and done. What? Ah! I just lost all those files. Well, you know, everything happens for a reason. Uh, a little help, Andy? Uh, God helps those who help themselves, Clarence. When God closes a door, well, he opens a window. <laughs> oh, that's me. <laughs> Don't ask for help from me. <laughs> well, we are looking at uh, cliches. That's so cliche in a series that we're in. And we're in week three where we've been looking at some cliches that look right, they sound right. Uh, when we with unexamined, but then when we take a moment and we look them up and say, you know, what does the Bible have to say about that cliche? Is that right? We're finding that really there's part of it that's true, but really there's a part of it that's not, and maybe it's best if we don't say that. And so today we're going to be looking at another common uh, Christian statement, uh, a cliche, and let's read it out loud together. It's on your side screens. Ready? Well, let's do it together. God won't give me, give you more than you can handle, right? He won't give you more than you can. Now, how many of you have heard that before? That's pretty universal. Man, many of you have probably said it, you know, because you're not sure what to say sometimes when you're, you're talking to somebody, they're in a tough place in their life, and you want to kind of give some counsel, and, you, you know, it's, it's awkward, that awkward moment. So you throw this out because you just picked it up. Somebody might have said it to you. You heard it, and uh, this is something. It's a, it fills the space. So we're going to look at that and say, well, you know, is this really, is this something we should be saying or is this something maybe we should scrub from our vocabulary? Now, this little piece of wisdom, uh, I guess, has found its roots from a verse there in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And here's the verse from the Common English Bible. It says, no temptation has seized you that isn't common for people, but God is faithful. He won't allow you to be tempted beyond your abilities. Instead, with temptation, God will also supply a way out so that you will be able to endure it. Now, in the center of that verse, you can kind of, maybe, maybe that's where it came from, where it says, he won't let you be tempted abo above your abilities or above your, you know, what you're able to handle. And so, you know, evidently that's where that slogan or that cliche has come from. But the problem is that when generally when we're talking to somebody in a difficult situation, we give that, that cliche, but this verse is talking about something different. It's talking about temptation. Temptation, which is a completely different thing than being in, you know, hardship or, you know, you've lost your job or you found you have an illness. That's not temptation. That's a different issue that's going on. And so that's, that's the problem. So we're going to look at this cliche, and we're going to really say, okay, what, what are two truths about God that we can learn and then apply it to this cliche? Number one is, is God leads us away from temptation. Now, as I said, this verse is about temptation, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Uh, Paul is addressing this letter. Uh, this is a, uh, he's writing to the church in Corinth. Corinth was a large uh, Greco-Roman city, uh, back in, 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 in uh, the, you know, the early days of uh, when the Bible was being written and really had its roots way before that. And Paul had started a church there in 51 AD, stayed about 18 months there planting that church. And then he would go on and plant other churches. And Paul had a habit of staying in touch with the churches that he had started, writing letters, helping them kind of process the issues that they're going through. This letter is one of those situations. In Corinth, it was a very, very common known place for pagan worship. Sharon and I have, have gone to ancient Corinth and walked the streets there. Almost on every street corner is a, is a temple. Temple, pagan temple worship was very common. Temple prostitution, uh, also just idolatry. That was, that was part of that pagan practice. 
and it was a very big part of, of what they did. The, there was festivities around uh, uh, pagan, pagan, the, uh, the idolatry and the, and the pagan worship. There was food and, and fun. I mean, it was part of what the community did. So here these newly minted Christians, they come, are called out of that behavior, out of that, that, that social environment, and some of them are falling back into it again because that's what their friends are doing and they had so much fun and, and so some of them are being tempted to go back to that. And so Paul, he's writing to them and he, he appeals to the Israelites after they had been delivered from Egypt through the Red Sea. They're in the, the desert before they've gotten into the promised land. God's forming them. He's forming them into the, the, the people that will follow him and, and instilling into them godly values. And some of them, these Israelites, were being pulled back to paganism and, and to the idolatry of the Egyptians, where they made a golden calf again and they started praying, you know, doing all the sexual immorality that goes with some of that stuff. And, and he, goes, he goes, this is what they did. Don't do that. It didn't go well for them. And he points out a few of those things. Here's where we pick that up there in verse 6 and 7. He says, now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. He's talking about the Israelites. Don't be idolaters as some of them were. So he's saying, yeah, don't do that. And, and he says, really what you're doing, it's not, it's not new. The temptation to do it is not new. It goes all the way back to the Israelites. And now some of them were thinking, well, I wouldn't do it. I'm above that. So he addresses that. He goes, so if you think you're standing firm, in other words, you don't think that you can, you can, you know, you're, str you're strong and you're not going to fall to temptation. He says, be careful that you don't fall. And then he launches into that verse. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. He says, the struggles that you're experiencing, those temptations, you see those, you're in the Greco-Roman period, all the way back in the Israelite period, same thing. Then he says, but, and God is faithful. There in the NIV, he says, he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Therefore, my dear friends, and here's the point of it, flee from idolatry. So here's what he's talking about. He's talking about being tempted to being caught up in idolatry and the sexual immorality that went with that. Now, that may not be your struggle, idolatry, but we still have temptations today, right? We all, that's, that's common to us. Temptations, all the stuff goes all the way back to the beginning of time when God created uh, humanity. There's just, there's temptation that's part of that, right? Goes along with the turf. Uh, I'm tempted, you're tempted. Recent, just about a week ago, I was tempted and I didn't do so well. Uh, I'll, let me tell you about it. In my neighborhood, I've lived there for about 20 years. And uh, that's a long time. Just, and we have a quiet little neighborhood. Some of you have been to my house or, you know, just it's in, uh, off of Providence Road, Little Street, Avalon Avenue. 20 years, no problems with the street corner as we're leaving. But last year, they decided to put up a, a uh, do not turn on red. Do, don't take a right turn on red. Now, 19 years, I'm, nobody, we haven't had any problems. I don't know how that got passed. I don't know who brought that in. I, they didn't consult me, I can tell you that much. I did not appreciate that. That's slowing me down. You know, I don't like waiting there. It's a neighborhood for crying out loud. We don't even have those kinds of signs on the big intersections like in Independence and, and uh, 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 Virginia Beach Boulevard, or name it, right? You can take a right everywhere. And here it's a little neighborhood. And they're making you sit there for like three minutes while you know, nobody's around. So... Am I communicating my frustration? <laughs> so about a week ago, Sharon comes in on a late flight. Her flight was, was delayed. And so it's like midnight. I have to go and get her. And so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, well, you know, I, I'm a little late. I didn't budget my time properly. So you can see where I'm going with it. So I, I go up to this light. And no, it's Providence Road, middle, midnight. Nobody is around except for another neighbor who's behind me who's probably hoping I'm going to go ahead and, and go so he can go. So I look around, I think, this is ridiculous. So I go ahead and take the right on the red. The guy behind me wasn't a neighbor. He was a cop. <laughs> <laughs> 
So the lights flicked on, he pulls me over. I start pulling out all the tricks in the book, you know. My wife's, you know, I'm late, she's at the airport, puppy dog look, anything. He doesn't care, <laughs> nothing's working, he gives me a ticket. You know, so that's, you know, I, I didn't do what, that. I was being tempted, right? But God didn't tempt me to do that. I, I, I'm doing fine just without him, right? <laughs> just, I mean, I, I, I have the own, my own pride, my own selfishness, the things in me, I just get tempted. And sometimes I don't do too well at it. My dog got tempted recently. <laughs> Yesterday, two days ago, I, I have an office in my house. I have one here also, but just, well, I like to study in my house sometimes. And I'm studying and all the dog comes up. He starts retching, you know, and then vomits a lot of vomit all right next to me. And I'm just trying to study. And, <laughs> whoa, you know, just vomits. It's, just, you know, it's like sticks. It's outside stuff. My, you know, like seeds. I mean, there's like a half a dead bird or something. <laughs> just weird stuff. It smells. Something. So I scream at him. You know, I'm upset. And we feed him good. It's not like he's like starved. He gets good, delicious food morning and night. There's no need for that. But he got, he went out there and he got tempted. You know, the, that seed looks good, and that pine cone, and that bird, or whatever. You know? <laughs> we fall to temptation, right? We all, we, that's a tendency. It's within us. The devil will tempt us. There's satanic, you know, uh, worldly powers that, that tempt us. That's not God. He doesn't tempt us. God's not in the business of tempting us. Actually, God wants us to do well. He wants us to walk the right path. He, he, he's, he brings his spirit along to, to, and, and speaks into our mind and into our conscience and says, maybe you shouldn't do that. Right. And it's up to us to listen to what he says. He'll put roadblocks and red flags in our lives and, and, and make it difficult. And then on our bullheaded, we think, well, I'm going around that. I'm not listening. We have a multi, the Bible says in a multitude of counselors, there is wisdom. God will put counselors around us. Ah, I'm not listening to you. I'm going to do my own thing. See, there's over and over, God will say, no, I'm trying to lead you in paths of righteousness. Yeah. Not that path. But we, you know, we just, we, temptation sometimes gets the best of us. You know, I think of that prayer in the, uh, the Lord's Prayer, where he says, Jesus is teaching his disciples where to pray this prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You know, you think about that, and um, you wonder, is that, is God, is that his mission? Is he's like leading us into temptation, and we have to pray against that? Now, God, I know what's on your agenda. You're trying to harass me with all these temptations. And so we pray, lead me not into temptation, right? I mean, that, I think sometimes that's what we think that that verse is talking about. You know, we have to kind of, kind of divert God away from his intentions. But he's really not inclined to tempt us. That's not his, his intentions. I look at this verse for one of, just one of many. He says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. See, God's not out to tempt you. That's not his, his agenda. And so really, when we're thinking of that, that prayer in the Lord's prayer, you know, I, maybe it'd be better to move the comma you know, the, the punctuation, and just lead us. That's the emphasis. God, lead us. Because we're going to, we, we, we get involved in temptation because of our own stuff in our heart. The, the, the devil's tempting us. Not you, but so Lord, lead us. Not as I would go in my own temptation and deliver me from evil. Maybe that's really the, the heart of what's going on there. That God's really not trying to do that. We got to try to convince him to do otherwise. God wants us to do right. We're the ones that mess that up so often. So 1 Corinthians 10, 13, very, very powerful verse. It really, it, it's, it's, it's one of the first verses I learned. To, I memorized it, you know, because it's, I, want, I don't want to be tempted and fall into temptation. So the Bible says that. He says, you know, it's, it's, it, there's power in resisting the, the devil and, and fleeing from him. There is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. It's a very powerful verse. When you're being tempted, God wants to help you. But that's not a verse about suffering and hardship. That's a different issue. Number two, well, another truth we learn about God is God helps us handle all that we've been given. 
God helps us all that we've been given. That's quite a bit different than God won't give you more than you can handle. The emphasis is that, sure, there is things in life that will come your way. You might not ask for it, but you've been given it. But God's job is to come along and help you. See, the implication is, is God won't give you more than you can handle. This is God's kind of given it out. We looked at that two weeks ago. You know, and the Bible says God gives good gifts. He's not the one in, you know, causing us, you know, he doesn't give children cancer and cause people to get raped and murdered. I mean, that's, there's an agenda out there by demonic forces. There's, 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 there's our own pride, our own issues. Sometimes just the natural forces in, 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 in the world. There's a lot of things that collide with us. But God is not the one who's dishing that stuff out. You know, but this is kind of the, the idea with this cliche. Is God's giving you some hardship? And he knows you're, he, he, he's, he's pretty sure you can take more. In fact, he knows you can. So he gives you more. And he's, ah, you won't break. I can give you more. I mean, that, that doesn't sound very comforting to me, right? You know, you lose three friends this year. And, uh, but he knows that that's not your breaking point. You're devastated. But you could lose another friend or two and you'll still be fine before you collapse. I mean, this isn't that kind of squirrely if you actually start thinking about it? That's God. He's just, he, he'll just give us all the way up to, he knows you'll collapse into a pile at this point, and he'll just he'll go right to the edge and go, okay, we're done. No, that's not how it works. You see throughout Scripture, you see God is the one who comes along and brings comfort. God comes along and brings support. God brings healing. God, God is not the one who's, dishing out all of these things and just knowing, oh, you can, you, you know, all the way up to the point of your breaking, but not at that point. It's interesting in your life, if you look at it, like, for example, sometimes uh, it doesn't happen very often, but sometimes as our cells are reduplicating, they, uh, they, they, uh, they mutate. And in the mutation, sometimes our, our, uh, uh, they, they affect other cells around them. Sometimes our body's immune system or its defense mechanism can, can, can take care of that, can resolve that, that, that cellular m- mutation problem. Other times, and it's rare, but that mutation continues on as the cells are dividing and it starts cannibalizing other cells around it and uh, destroying tissue around it. We call that cancer. But God doesn't go around injecting people with cancer. It happens because we have 15 billion cells 15 trillion cells in our body. And they, as, they, as they're always uh, dividing and multiplying, sometimes that DNA doesn't transfer. That gets broken sometimes. And, and uh, it just that's part of the being, in, in, in being human and in, our, in, in the world we live. We know a lot about things in the world like um, floods and hurricanes and tornadoes, earthquakes, and that those things are part of the natural order of things to bring stasis within the, the world that we live. So it really, so the planet can sustain life. For example, we know that sometimes uh, earthquakes are created because of uh, the, there's like a, the earth is trying to cool itself. There's a superheating of magma. And as it comes up through the rocks, through the earth, into the earth's surface, it starts to shift some of the tectonic plates. And... And, and then it cools off and comes back down again. But part of the process of the earth is, you know, that, that needs to happen but to bring, to sustain life. But when the forces of nature collide with people, we usually, we usually lose that battle. And then we get hurt. Now God, in his grace and his mercy, will bring healing many times. Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. We, we talk about this as the already but not yet. God's kingdom, his presence is here on earth. Jesus Christ brought the inauguration of the kingdom of God. In that comes a wealth of blessings, one of those being healing. But it doesn't always happen because God's kingdom is not always fully realized here. It will in heaven, but right now it's, we don't see that all the time. So we still pray for God's healing, pray for God's intervention, but it doesn't always happen. But God's not the one giving people cancer. He's not the one causing those bad things happen. He's, he's on our side. That's good to know, right? He, you know, because that, that changes everything. God dishing it out. He knows your breaking point. 
or the world that we live in, the evils that are around, and God wants to come and support you and help you. That's the difference. That's why I would suggest that you scrub this cliche from your vocabulary, because it's really not, when we look at it against Scripture, we find out, well, that's really not a biblical statement at all. The word of Scripture we see time and time again is found like, for example, when Peter says, cast all your cares upon God, for he cares for you. God cares about us. So you cast all your cares upon him. That's quite a bit different. Or when the psalmist says, in Psalm 46, he says, God is our refuge and strength, a help always near in times of great trouble. That's why we won't be afraid when the world falls apart, when the mountains crumble into the center of the sea. Sometimes that's how our life feels. It's just crumbling. You know, our world falls apart. Sharon and I started this church 21 years ago. I've been the pastor for 21 years. Sharon and I have pastored this church, and, and, and I've seen some pretty horrific stuff happen. And, uh, you know, been there for some, you know, kid, you know, some... Some of you, your children have, you've buried your children. And, and, or we've had some suicides. And I had a guy come up to me after this last service. He goes, just last Monday, my wife went to bed. And, she, and then when I got up in the morning, she was, she was dead. And I said, do you know why? No, just went to bed. I thought she was fine. I mean, you know, things like that happen. And I can tell you that when, when um, many times when I've come and stood with you, I wonder, how, can you, how are they even going to make it? You know, this is just so, so, so incredibly hard. But over the years, as they trust in Christ, as they trust in the Lord, as God brings his people and they allow the comforting power of, of their small group or the people of God to, to stand with them, they do make it. They do make it. And you remind yourself that God is with you. Even if you can't hear him, you just remind yourself, you know, I know, I know. God's standing with me. And that God's promise is that he'll bring joy in your life again that will overshadow the grief and the sorrow. Because in those moments, that's all you feel. That's all you can see. But God says, I will walk with you through that. Right. And it's, it's an amazing thing to see God walk and use the, 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 his Holy Spirit, use the power of the body of Christ to stand with people, to walk with people, and see how God, God wor works through all those things. And the psalmist says, even though all of my life is cr you know, crashing into the sea and my world is falling apart, he is my refuge. He is my comfort. The prophet Zechariah was born in Babylon, even though he was a Jew, because he was born in exile. He was born in a place of hardship. But his contemporaries, Zerubbabel and Joshua, were able to bring and lead the people of Israel back to the promised land. But not everybody was able to go for different reasons. Some people couldn't go because of financial hardship. They were indentured in a, in a, in, 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 as a servant or in their employment. Different things went on. Not everybody was able to go. And so those people felt like, here's God blessing all those people. Here I am stuck in this place. And maybe God's forgotten about me. Maybe, I don't, maybe I'm not part of that blessing, that covenant, the blessing that comes with being a child of God. And so Zechariah, he speaks to them. He says this, he goes, as for you, he's talking about these people who are in this, 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 still in Babylon. He's saying, because of the blood of my covenant, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. He uses that imagery of the waterless pit, which they would have been aware of. Joseph was thrown into a waterless pit when he was betrayed by his brothers. And, and that's where it all started. That became a domino effect of a lot of hardship in his life. But they knew the story that God redeemed that difficult situation to where he ended up being the second in command in Egypt. Being able to be used by God to bless thousands of people, bring life to thousands and thousands of people. He says, no, yeah, you're in a, no doubt about it, you're in a waterless pit right now. He goes, but God will free you. And then, I love this, he goes, return to your fortress, talking about God. He says, you prisoners of hope, 
Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. So he has this promise, but he calls him. I love that phrase where he says, you're a prisoner of hope. You know, when you look around and your circumstances look bleak, you know, your marriage looks bleak, your financial situation looks bleak, your job, your, your health, the health of a loved one, some situation, you're going, it, look, I'm just a prisoner. But when you have Christ, you're not just a prisoner, you're a prisoner of hope. You have the hope that God will do something in your life, that he will overshadow that grief, that sorrow, that challenge someday with joy, that he will bless you, tw- like he says here, that twi- restore twice as much. God is in the business of restoring. And so, or we use the word redeeming, where he redeems something and uh, restores th- something that the enemy has taken or something we've squandered. And he gives that promise. You know, that's the promise that, that um, Paul held on to, in, in Romans, when we read this wonderful verse in Romans, uh, in chapter 8, some of you have, have, have committed that to memory. When, when he's talking about how he's put his hope, and this is where he gets his confidence. He says, confidence, he says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Or you could say, what would separate us from the love of Christ? And he gives a list. He goes, will hardships, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the truth, that God sustains us through his love, through his power, through his people, that's why in our small groups or so, we talk about this so much. Because it's other people that are journeying along the same journey we're on. And there's power that comes by doing it together. There's power. I want to close with a story about Annie Johnson Flint, born in 1866 in a small town in New Jersey. Her mother died when she was three. Her, daughter, her, her father became very ill, couldn't take care of her and her, and, and her siblings, so she, he, he had to put them up for adoption. Annie was adopted by a wonderful family, the Flint family. But then it wasn't just a few years later that, that, uh, that the Flint, both the Flint parents from sicknesses ended up dying before she graduated high school. She lost two sets of parents before she graduated high school. Graduated high school, went to, uh, to college. To, she wanted to be a teacher, so she got her teaching degree and just started teaching, and she found out from the doctor that she had a degenerative bone illness disease that would paralyze her for life. She ended up in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. There's a picture of her kind of later in her years. She was in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. She couldn't teach anymore. So she decided to write and to write poetry and to write hymns. And out of all of that calamity, you'd look at her life and you'd say, well, I wonder what kind of stuff she wrote. Well, she, wrote, she became very, very well known for incredibly encouraging poetry and hymns. Here's one I want to just read to you. This is a portion of a hymn called God Hath Not Promised. And here's how it goes. It starts out, the first stanza starts out, God hath not promised, sky's always blue, flower-strewn pathways all our lives through. God hath not promised sun without rain, joy without sorrow, peace without pain. And then she ends that hymn by saying this, but God hath promised strength for the day, rest for the labor, light for the way, grace for the trials, help from above, unfailing sympathy undying love. Tremendous statement. So if you're struggling with temptation, you go to 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God's not going to lead you that way. He's going to lead you away from temptation. He'll give you strength for that. But if you're in hardship and you're in a tough place in your life, God says, I want to come and bring comfort. Jesus says, he calls the Holy Spirit the comfort. He says, the comforter will come and, 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 and aid you. That's God's Holy Spirit. And also God's, the body of Christ comes and people are an incredible support. So if you're not in a place of, of pain and difficulty, maybe you can be the hand of Christ in somebody's life and come alongside them and support them. Yeah. 
because that's how God works. Let's stand and we'll close in a word of prayer. You know, I think of that psalm one more time. God is our refuge and strength, a help always near in times of great trouble. That's why we won't be afraid when the world falls apart. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now, Lord, and and I know that there's some that their their world is falling apart, or maybe it's already happened. And you look around and you see rubble. You see a, you, you, you don't see flowers. You see barrenness. And God, I, I just pray that right now you bring your comforter into their life. Because there's something that happens that's not just our circumstances, that you, you work in and through us. So Lord, bring your comfort and peace right now. I'm going to invite our prayer teams to come forward. Some of them are already making their way up. I'm going to invite you to receive prayer. Some of you just need to get, you need to get prayer. Have somebody stand with you, part of the body of Christ. And so you can slip out anytime while I'm praying. If you're in the middle, you can just come on up. Just let them out. If somebody's in the middle and they want to get prayer. Lord, I I pray, Father, for those who are experiencing temptation because that that can be very, very difficult when we're struggling. We're knowing that if I go in this direction, some pretty bad stuff could happen. And that temptation just kind of grips our mind. And so in Jesus' name, I just pray against that, that you, God, will give you the strength to endure it. We'll give you a way out. I pray that you would would, uh, heed godly counsel in your life. I pray that you would heed obvious signs and blocks and red flags that would say wait wait on this go a different direction I also pray Lord for those who are in adversity right now in difficulty God we know that you are not the one on a mission to make our life hard and so we, we say, God, we're going to release you from that. That's that, that cliche that blames you for that. It's just wrong. You're the one who sustains us. You're the one who carries us. You're the one who loves us, and nothing can get in the way of that love. Bring your healing, Father. Lord, we pray for the kingdom of God to be manifest right here, Lord. Just bring your comfort, bring your healing power, bring the the gifts of the Spirit to do their work. Lord, I pray for people who are experiencing hardship in their marriage. It's a courageous thing to make a commitment to another person and say, I'm going to stick it out. I'm going to stick it out. That's, that, that's impossible, really, right? It takes God's grace and God's power. So, Lord, I just pray for that right now, Lord, your grace and your power, the ability to forgive, the ability to let go, the ability to love when we don't feel loved. Lord, I pray for those who are experiencing physical sickness. Lord, for your grace to bring healing there. Some of you, you know, this might be the day where God's inbreaking of his power comes and brings healing to something you might have had for years. Doctors told you it's over, that you're going to live with that. Maybe this is your day. Come on up and receive prayer. God, we're so thankful that you are ever present comforter and strength and refuge. If you've never put your faith into Christ, why not do that? Say, Jesus Christ, come into my life. I want to live for you. I want your power real in my life. I'm going to begin a relationship by talking with you in prayer, by getting involved in in the body of Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.